Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum. Um, and I'd like to welcome our online audiences today and also the audiences that will be listening to this later on our YouTube channel or our Facebook channels. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody that we have almost 300 programs that we've done like this since the start of the pandemic um, that shut down the Commonwealth Club's live audience uh, capacity in San Francisco. And we've taken advantage of this fact by bringing authors from all over the world. And we have today, we have um, David Reynolds from New York. I think that's where you're located, right? Yes, <laughs> and, uh, I he's, am. <laughs> he's going to talk about his book, Abe, um, a, a book on Abe Lincoln, uh, great pictures and a really great overall summary. Uh, and not just summary, but detail about a lot of the cultural context in which Abe Lincoln grew up, why he thought the way he did. and. What I liked was a lot of the nuances of how he moved his way through the center uh, in a way that some, will sound familiar to everybody talking about politicians today, leaving a little bit of blank space so that everybody can imagine what it is that he'll do. Uh, and that's how you succeed. So thank you very much for joining us, David. And uh, it's why, don't, why don't you uh, give us a little overview of this, of the book first. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I call it a cultural biography. I've written cultural biographies of Walt Whitman, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and John Brown. And now I turn to Abraham Lincoln. And by cultural biography, it's based on the idea that um, we're all in part shaped by our immediate culture and by the larger culture uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, and the images and the ideas from that culture kind of permeate our consciousness and uh, to some degree control our attitudes and shape our behavior. So it's really a matter then of um, trying to figure out what the culture of, of Lincoln was. There have been many wonder there have been over 16,000 books on, on Lincoln, many wonderful books. But uh, you can read many of them and not hear about, for example, Walt Whitman, uh, people in his own lifetime, um, Herman Melville, Edgar Allan Poe, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, so, and, and some uh, the Davy Crockett uh, manuscript, almanacs, and uh, there were so many elements of his, his culture that are completely left out, and yet they were very meaningful for understanding him. Mm -hmm. And the po poetry that he loved, the poetry he loved, the plays he loved. Uh, he could memorize Shakespeare by the page, even though he had less than one year of education. Uh, once he read something, it was on his hard disk up here. <laughs> yeah. And he could, uh, <laughs> really, it was kind of there. And he would recite this stuff not to impress anybody. It's just because these passages were me me meaningful to him. To him, yeah. it, it wasn't like he was at a cocktail party and said, oh, let me recite The Raven or something like that. Mm. So I wanted to catch a lot of those elements uh, in his life, the, the elements that were, and the songs he loved and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the way they kind of helped to shape him, uh, because um, Emerson, who is his contemporary, said there's one person who re really sticks out uh, as one of the great heroes for spanning the whole range of experience from the highest to the lowest until Emerson said that the very dogs believe in him. <laughs> the very dogs <laughs> <believe>. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of Lincoln I try to portray, portray. not mm -hmm. just the thread of his life or even his political environment. It's really more his cultural environment. And I never want to let him far off the map as I'm writing. In other words, I don't want to, go for 10 pages on whatever, poetry or right. something. I, I want to weave it like a tapestry right, right into his biography, into his biography. Yeah. <laughs> well, he did a, a great job of that. And I, I you know, the several parts of it, you know, like the, the romantic melancholy poetry that he loved so much that matched his own ups and downs and his wife's ups and downs and, you know, so many other characters, you know, that this was sort of the, the, the way to live, even though, he was, as you said, uh, uh, really in favor of rationality and dealing with things in a rational way. I thought, uh, you know, just talking about his deism, for example, um, which got him in trouble politically, so he, he, he suppressed it. But he certainly used that approach to try to not believe in a higher law that both sides were using to, 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 to fight each other. 
that, that something higher was the way to go. And he, he just know we're, it's our human laws that we have to follow. Great insight, I thought. Yeah, yeah, he was a, I mean, he was really controlled by his reason, by his reason, and, and yet there were moments of great irrationality, mm-hmm. particularly when Ann Rutledge dies and he becomes suicidal at that point. He was beset by melancholy, by moments of what we would call depression. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he got a little bit suicidal again around the time of his marriage to uh, Mary Todd. However, having said that, there was a fundamentally rational side that in really difficult situations would take over. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, he was a follower of a lot of the founding fathers who, whatever their religious opinions were, they were basically deists Mm -hmm. who were rational. They were rationalists and they believed in human reason and in the laws of nature and also the laws of man. Of, mm-hmm. of, 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 of society and try not to transcend those law, laws in the interest of serving a higher law that was, mm-hmm. let's say, beyond the Constitution or beyond positive law. So, yeah, he always tried to remain within the law as much as possible, even though in the end he tried to shape a law because he kept pushing and pushing and pushing until finally after the Civil War, Indeed, we had the 13th Amendment. There was an amendment to the Constitution that he was totally Mm. supportive of, which emancipated 4 million enslaved um, uh, uh, black people. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he didn't want to uh, do like what John Brown did before before the Civil War, who really followed his own higher law and said, I'm going to go down south and I'm going to free the slaves single-handedly by starting a slave rebellion that's going to mm-hmm. uh, eventually topple slavery. And, and he's, Lincoln said, I sympathize with John Brown. He's, he's very generous. He, he, he feels the same way I do about emancipating enslaved people, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to, going to go beyond human law, a uh, positive law or the constitution and take it upon myself to try to do this individually. I'm going to try to do it through the election process, the process that the founders gave, gave to us in the Constitution, through elections, through ballots, and not through bullets. Yeah. Yeah, well, both sides, uh, of course, appealed to the higher law and, and thought it was on their side. Um, not too much different than, you know, when the Yankees play the Mets. Um, you know, both, <laughs> both, both sides assume that God's on their side to win the game. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have some, some slides about the 1860s election, um, which show how an election is run. Now, we're, we're almost a, a week away from another election here. Um, and, and, and interestingly, uh, one of the points you made was that uh, politicians didn't go traveling around, uh, even though there was no COVID then. Uh, they didn't go traveling around. Uh, they had other people travel. So that was one part of it. But why don't you show some of the, the way that politics was run uh, so that people, you know, have an idea that, you know, either that we're not as bad off as we think or that there's so much worse <laughs> we can get, you know, either, <laughs> either way you want to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for sure. This is um, an anti-Lincoln cartoon. Uh, actually, anti, it's called The Worship of the North. And it is per, uh, the North as portrayed from a Southern perspective. First of all, it's totally chaotic. It's um, the South said, oh, we have nice stable institutions and we're so orderly down here with our slavery and everything. And, you know, our plantations, look at the North. There are a bunch of chaotic movements and everything. And uh, pictured here, it's a little hard to figure it out. This is, I mean, it's hard to see all the details. Uh, it's in my book, and you can uh, read all about it in my book. But just to explain it, um, it shows a religious altar. That's the stones uh, in the middle uh, and the bottom. And at the bottom, the bottom stone, uh, it's hard to read, but it's called Puritanism. And the idea, the South believed that uh, Puritanism in the North, Puritanism had been the heritage of early New England, that by the 19th century, it had produced this uh, medley of very bizarre 
and dangerous and fanatical movements that had sprouted in so many different directions. And so there are other bricks on the altar above Puritanism. One is called socialism. They believe that uh, the Northerners were socialists. And it, it, Lincoln was not a socialist, but he grew the government much more than any previous president. Mm-hmm. And he believed that the government should do for the average person what the average person just cannot do by him or herself. So, I mean, and, and, and he was the first one who had a, uh, who instituted a um, federal income tax, which was weighted to tax the, the, the wealthy more than the poor. Actually, poor people didn't get taxed at all. Anyway, he was not a socialist, but, but he believed in, in a activist uh, federal government. And a, mm-hmm. a lot of Republicans kind of felt that way. So that's one brick. Another brick is witch burning. Well, witch burning harks back to, to Puritanism and the fact that they hang, they actually didn't burn them. They, <laughs> they hanged them, and one of them they, they pressed to death under a stone, uh, tw- 20 alleged witches. Um, mm-hmm. and, then bring, and then there's one uh, there called Free Love. Well, that was another movement in the North uh, that was allied to another stone on the altar called spirit wrapping, which is spiritualism. Spiritualism was the idea that you could communicate with dead people. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mary Todd Lincoln became quite involved with spiritualism, particularly after Willie died, the 11-year-old Willie dies in, in the, the White House. And she has many seances, and she gets to see not only Willie, but her other dead son, Eddie, mm-hmm. who comes on a regular basis. And she gets to see... She, she, there's, and then after Lincoln dies, um, there's a picture of, uh, which is in my book, of Mary Todd Lincoln with the ghost of, you know, it was their version of Photoshop, obviously, but anyway, yeah. with, a, with, <laughs> with, with, with the ghost of Lincoln in the background. But from the Southern perspective, this was, uh, these are a bunch of evil, wicked, superstitious movements. And then one of the bricks is called Negro worship. Uh, and that's why they called uh, Lincoln and his fellow Republicans the Black Republicans, because supposedly they, uh, they wanted a, an utter racial reversal mm-hmm. in America, whereby, and uh, on top of the stone called Negro worship is a white person who's being knifed by an anti-slavery preacher by the name of Henry Ward Beecher. So Beecher is mm-hmm. killing the white person as a sacrifice to the person sitting on top of the altar who is an African-American with a spear that has been handed to him by, uh, if you look to on the same level in that picture, uh, the statue of John Brown, who's holding a spear. John mm-hmm. Brown was deceased, but there's the statue because he had handed out spears to um, people in Virginia, to enslaved people in Virginia to uh, take guard over their masters. So it's it's an image of the North as seen mm-hmm. from the South. Um, so, yeah. One of the things you point out in your book, which I thought was very interesting, was that uh, the South was at least partially populated in the 1650s by Cavaliers. And those Cavaliers were basically kicked out of England by Cromwell, who was a Puritan. And so, so they, they had a, a thing against the Puritans from the start, basically, from 1650. And we're talking about 200 years later, almost. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and, and yet, yet here it is still the Cavaliers against the Puritans. I thought that was a great way to start the book. Um, and, and although I knew a little bit about that, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of how you know, they could trace back their history and say, we've always been put upon by the Puritan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's this, even today, we have certain cultural myths of, uh, that surround the blue states and what, what, however you want to characterize what the blue states are or the red states. And, and, and a, lot of the, a lot of these myths have built up over, over time. And they produce mm. a certain version today. And back then, the myth of the Cavalier versus the, the Puritan, which lasted uh, since the 1640s onward, because when Cromwell takes over, a lot of the Cavaliers who were royalists then go to Virginia, whereas the Puritans under Cromwell, uh, a lot of them 
even before Cromwell had come to America. So mm. New England versus the South, the Puritan versus the Cavalier. The one time they came together and fought the common em- enemy was during the revolution, American revolution. Mm. But then, but then the strands kind of came apart on the cultural level again. And so a lot of people back then actually thought that the war was really about this basic cultural difference this mm-hmm. cultural difference between the Cavalier and the Puritan. And Lincoln himself was fascinated by this, um, although he didn't like to talk about it for the mm-hmm. same reason he didn't he didn't like to talk about secession, for example. He didn't want to even think that there was another country called the Confederate States. He would say the so-called Confederacy or something. Mm-hmm. He, he didn't want to bring, and he never really liked to mention Puritan, although se- uh, secretly, he knew that on one side, on his mother's side, he went back to a Virginia planter that he called an aristocrat, and a, a, a cavalier. And mm-hmm. on his father's side, he went back to very early Puritan New, Eng- New England. Mm-hmm. So he knew those two strands were there. But he actually wanted to present himself. There was one person, like a great-grandmother, who was like a, a Quaker but everybody else was not a Quaker, but he, in a, he allowed his biographers to say he is descended from Quaker and ancestry. And right. said, oh, yes, Quakers. But why? Because Quakers, to some degree, even though they were anti-slavery, they were sort of accepted by the South because they didn't really want to go to war. Uh, they didn't want to mm-hmm. go to war over slavery. Uh, and they were accepted by the North because they were anti-slavery. But even during mm-hmm. the Civil War, a lot of them became conscientious objectors and so forth. So in a way, it was safer for for him to say, oh, from Quaker stock, you know, that kind of right, thing. Right, right. And uh, <laughs> as, oppo- as opposed to Puritan and Cavalier, you know. <laughs> the, the original Pocahontas claim, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we have more pictures as we get the next one. Yeah, this is the next picture. This is a mm-hmm. picture uh, somewhat similar to the other one, but this is a picture by Lincoln's opponents showing him he didn't have a beard at this time in his life and showing him being carried into what was called then a lunatic asylum. That's what they called them back then uh, by Horace Greeley, who was a fellow Republican. And he's being followed by these caricatured representations of various movements. One is free love, a woman representing free love uh, who can't wait basically to hop into bed with Abe and everything like that. And the Mormon, there's a Mormon who, uh, the Mormons had like uh, Joseph uh, um, um, Smith had 19 wives and Brigham Young had 55 wives and mm-hmm. polygamy, polygamy. So, uh, and they they were associated supposedly with the Republicans, uh, kind of fault, falsely associated, but still. Mm-hmm. So a Mormon is there and then there's uh, an African-American who's caricatured in, in, in this representation. Uh, and he's saying that um, I want to announce that there are no rights, no rights uh, of white people that, that black people have to respect whatsoever that, that we're mm-hmm. that, that all, and it's a reversal of the uh, Dred Scott decision, which said, which said um, mm-hmm. that black people have no, no rights that the white people have to, uh, respect. But everything is reversed here because they're trying to pile on this idea of, oh, the supremacy of of women, the unnatural elevation in society of African Americans and of Mormons and of free lovers. And there's Abe looking back at them and he says, don't worry when I'm elected, elected I'm going to get you all into the millennium that you're seeking. Mm. And you, you can all do your really, really weird things here you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like like tagging george mcgovern with the hippies right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not, oh, not, bound, sure. not bound to make the middle class like him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. exactly so um, and this was fascinating I mean, you're, gonna, it, you're gonna say a little bit about charles blonden i think it's oh, it, it's it's not remembered by a lot of people this guy actually tightrope walked in crazy ways across Niagara Falls. How how many times did he cross it? I mean, it was just, no wonder he got famous. I mean, this is, you know, makes evil Knievel look like a scaredy cat. I know. Well, 
I don't know if you pronounce his name Blondin or I call oh. him Blond Blondin. No, he's from France. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't his real name anyway. So let's call him Blondin. But yeah, without a net, it's it was uh, you know 1300 feet across. Also, it was difficult because it's very windy above mm -hmm. and uh, you had the spray coming up. He went across Niagara Falls. Uh, he did it um, on stilts, four foot stilts. He did it backwards. He did it at night. He did it in chains. Um, he did it um, carrying a man. It was it was hard to carry a man on his back because uh, you can't always control somebody else's movements. I mean, that's right. that's the difficulty of that. So that that one was was and also uh, pushing a wheelbarrow uh, across. But but popular cartoonists uh, seized on this and compared Lincoln. Uh, to being Blondin, and he compared compared himself several times to Blondin, uh, mm -hmm. because when people would come to him and say, "Can't you make this a more explicitly anti-slavery war from the very very beginning?" Mm -hmm. and he said, "Now wait a second here. Um, pretend that uh, I'm Blondin and I'm going across Niagara Falls pushing my wheelbarrow, and the wheelbarrow contained the entire American future in it." Would you tell me, uh, step right, step left? No, you would want to keep me right in the middle. He felt that he had to be right in the middle because it was such a, an age of conflict, just mm -hmm. and, and the nation was at war. And he said, if he said the wrong thing at the wrong time, he could easily have lost one of the five border states. Um, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, Maryland, Missouri. Mm -hmm. These were states that had slaves. Uh, uh, they had uh, in, enslaved people. They had enslaved people, and yet they were still loyal to the North. Mm -hmm. But at any moment, one of those could tumble into mm -hmm. the South. And he said, "Look, if I lose Kentucky, we're going to lose everything. We're going to lose everything." Mm -hmm. He, the the circumstances in a way forced him to be blonde, and even though he more than anybody else wanted the enslaved people to be emancipated. Mm -hmm. More than anyone, he 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 wanted that, but he had to be very very cautious to keep uh, the center the center very very strong, very strong. And then toward the end of the war, um, he became blonde and with like three people on his back. That's the the other cartoon there. Yeah, these are his cabinet members, and he looks very glum in that picture, rather sad because it was a difficult moment in the war. And the guy that fell off his back, Sam and Chase, had been both a wonderful secretary of the treasury, but also someone who always felt superior, superior um, mm -hmm. to, to Lincoln and uh, also schemed to try to get his place in the 1864 election. And finally, Lincoln, even though he admired him, had to fire him. That's why Chase is falling off, uh, mm -hmm. you know, falling off the back. And then the other two are kind of cantankerous, uh, uh, cabinet members and the you know, people on both sides saying different things. It's kind of hard to read it. You can read it in my book and stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. he identified with with Blondin. <laughs> well, it was a, a as you show and, and plenty of other people before uh, for the decades leading up to the Civil War was a, a, a big uh, contest of trying to keep things even between the North and the South in terms of the slave states. And the slave states knew that they were losing out to the immigration that was happening in the North. I, I thought it was fascinating to read that they they uh, thought of making Cuba a state, you know, taking over Cuba, making it a state uh, all around the Gulf, because all of those places had slaves. Um, then they could have more and more slave states. Uh, but when the when the uh, at the time of the revolution, the population was fairly even between the two uh, groups of states, you know, and there were only when there were only thirteen. So over time, it's the the population shift was against the South, and the South was always trying to figure out how to hold on to their power. They had a little bit more power, but, you know, and, and so it really was, uh, it's a great analogy. Uh, the, the cartoonist did a great job at the time. You know, he, got, he was so popular for doing such a crazy thing. Um, and and what, what the politics was required to do at the time was similarly crazy. It's interesting right now, we, we don't have a center at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the center, yeah, the center has disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the void we're falling into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. There's a couple other great cartoons too, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a uh, 
chapter called Blondin, Barnum, and Bohois, and we discussed Blondin. This P.T. Barnum, Barnum was a showman, mm. and he kind of invented show business, and he put on display um, people that back then were considered whatever aud- oddities or cur- curiosities. Uh, mm. This is this is him with his famous. Uh, Tom Thumb, who was a, a small person, who was a two foot six, and but 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 he also displayed the Fiji mermaid. He he displayed her in photos as uh, in posters as this beautiful blonde, curvaceous, half naked woman with blonde hair, and, and she was a mermaid. But it was actually a monkey's torso tied to a salmon's tail with a little mm. blonde wig on there suspended. But, but people would pay suspended in water. People right. would pay a lot of money to go see the Fiji mermaid or the woolly horse or the, oh, gosh, he had a, you know, whatever. He had like the tallest, the, the largest, the fattest and everything. And um, one exhibit that he put on was called What Is It? And this was a rather unfortunately racist exhibit in which uh, an African-American teenager with a tapering skull, a skull that was tapered, was stripped um, almost naked and put in a cage and displayed as what is it, as a supposedly the missing link between uh, human beings and the ape, uh, mm-hmm. and the monkey. And you were supposed to go and say, what is that thing? You know, it was, it was just a, a regular human being. It's a very cruel exhibit, but the opponents of Lincoln, you see, uh, showed him there he is with what is it saying, Oh, this is going to be my glorious successor in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in office. And Horace Greeley is on the other side, another Republican saying, yes, this is just a, uh, a, a wonderful thing for, for us to advance since this is a very racist kind of a point of view, but they're trying to uh, 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 link uh, uh, both Lincoln and Greeley and the rest of the Republican Party with a kind of unnatural vision of complete racial reversal in, in America, a mm-hmm. complete uh, uh, racial reversal. And it shows you the kind of nastiness, the nastiness uh, of that culture and the sensationalism of it. But Lincoln himself, in a sense, was put on exhibit uh, uh, because he didn't actually dress that way when he ran for office at all. He had been a law- lawyer for uh, 25 years. He, he wore very decent suits and he was a respectable mi- middle class even sometimes you might even say upper middle class lawyer and fairly mm-hmm. successful and everything but he was exhibited as in that picture on the left as Abe the Illinois rail splitter and everywhere in the campaign mm-hmm. and it's true that he had once split rails uh, to make fences to make fences and here he's splitting the Democratic Party uh, mm-hmm. with his mallet uh, because the Democratic Party split between the Douglas people and then the Southern Democrats. And in a way, it facilitated his victory. There was also the Union Party. There was even a, a fourth party as well. So he's splitting the opposing parties there. But it shows him in, in typical shirt sleeves, rolled up sleeves and everything, and the frontiersmen. The way he really lo- looked was uh, in the other picture there, which was a picture of the way he actually looked in 1860 by Brady, um, who was this um, photographer of that era. And uh, he Brady uh, took his collar. Lincoln had kind of a long neck. Mm-hmm. So he took his collar and po- pulled it up to kind of hide the long neck and, yeah. to make, and put his hand on, on books and made him look very respectable. <laughs> so you had the kind of the two images. And both images were sort of distributed. So... Mm-hmm. In a way, you could have both at the same time. You could have the frontiersman, but you could have the middle class, respectable. Uh, but in a way, this is this goes back to this um, Barnum-like culture, mm-hmm. putting uh, imagery on display as a mean, means of selling your candidate. Well, the Greatest Showman, the musical that came out just a couple of years ago, did the same thing, you know, with P.T. Barnum, right, and and and, and yeah. gave him a totally <laughs> different image than his reality, and of course. Uh, played by an extremely handsome man, so <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> which PT right. Barnum wasn't exactly. <laughs> yeah, 
So, so uh, the, the, the tendencies continue. But uh, yeah. it, it, and this, you have the picture of the wide awakes there. I, I think that that's a, it's a fascinating part. I, I thought I'd read, you know, most of this area and I had never read about this. And to think that the Republicans had this semi paramilitary group of young men. Um, they, they seem to have behaved themselves, but they, you know, if, if any of our candidates over the last, you know, since World War II anyway, had done anything like this, you know, um, everybody would have used, used, uh, you know, epitaphs on them of being fascist, obviously. So it, it yeah, was, yeah, yeah. why don't you tell about that? Well, uh, actually it grew originally out of the Bahoy. The Bahoy was the working class figure pictured in the other picture there with the top hat. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln might have even been following the Bahoy because the Bahoy, yeah, I mean, in wearing that kind of hat, because the Bahoy was the working class butcher or the whatever, you know, the the, the day laborer um, who was a uh, uh, hardworking, usually a volunteer fireman, and he he uh, lo loved to uh, go down the street with his gahel. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, who's pictured there as well? Uh, she was the sort of the the, the average um, American woman, working class woman of the streets. And when Walt Whitman uh, in 1855 wrote about, uh, he said, "I am one of the roughs. I'm turbulent, sensual, drinking, e you know, uh, breeding." He was. None of those things whatsoever. But the Bahoy was all of those things, and that's why Walt. <laughs> Whit Whitman was not a, was not a drinker, was not a breeder, was not a rough or anything like that. But yeah. he presented himself that way because he wanted to key into that. In fact, the first three three reviews of Leaves of Grass said Whitman is the Bahoy poet, and so Lincoln comes along uh, because when uh, Whitman's poetry fails to reach people, he says, "I fantasize about." a hearty man coming from the West, coming over the Alleghenies, kind of grizzled and, and, and kind of rough and just a working class figure. And and Lincoln had been, um, you know, a work, working class figure and that's how he was sold. So he, in a way he was like the, the Bahoy uh, on, on kind of a, a mass level, on a, a grand level. And then a lot of these rough types uh, identified with him and um, they came to his early speeches and they were kind of excited because he was sort of a casual speaker. He knew how to use a little bit of slang now and then. He knew how to tell jokes and he knew mm -hmm. how to kind of reach the average person. And these somewhat slovenly types suddenly tightened up and they said, we're going to go march. We're going to go march for, uh, they were called the wide awakes. We're going to go uh, mm -hmm. and they would carry their torches. I mean, to us, it's a little scary, but they would carry mm -hmm. their torches in, in oil skin coats and they would march mm -hmm. through the streets. And uh, But these were basically the Bahois, but they're all dressed up now uh, as right. wide awakes. <laughs> well, it was interesting. You, you talk a lot about the rough, the rough and tumble culture, obviously, of uh, of settlers uh, going off and living in a very rough nature. And we'll, we'll go back. I hope we have time to go back to his childhood because it was very much like that. Um, but in appealing to them, he knew what he was doing because he saw that Douglas, uh, his, his big competitor, had gotten them excited. Um, and then he knew he had to win that vote. So it's interesting. He, as, a, as a politician, he knew exactly what he was doing when he saw this group treat him that way in Connecticut. He said, let's use this. We, we're going to use this. And you, I think how many, how many of this group of the wide awakes were there by the end of the election? I think how many people had joined it was a couple hundred thousand. Uh, th th thousands uh, had joined because virtually every city, I don't know the exact number, but mm -hmm. virtually every city, not only every city, but even every town had wide awake clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and Lincoln really knew that he had to win Young America, what was called Young America, which had previously been owned by the mm -hmm. Democrats. Back then, the Democrats were the conservatives in general, and mm -hmm. the Republicans were the liberal. And it was very hard for the Republicans, who were the liberals, to win over uh, a lot of people. But uh, they did, and Lincoln was largely responsible for that, whereas Stephen Douglas, his competitor, who was a Democrat, 
had been the god of young America previously. He was a very pugnacious and he was a terrible white supremacist as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh God. But I mean, but he appealed to the kind of racist um, uh, atmosphere among among his followers and a lot of the the young rough types at that time were kind of racist and as as, as well as being a lot of them kind of whatever hard workers and uh, uh, had certain virtues, but at the same time, they were kind of pulled into that kind of atmosphere. But then in the 1850s, what happened is that Harriet Beecher Stowe came along mm-hmm. in a lot and the slavery cr- uh, crisis deepened and people, uh, even the, even the young people started saying this racism that we've been following and this kind of pro slavery thing is, mm-hmm. is, is wrong, is wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there was a groundswell of movement, even among you know young America and everyone, toward a, a more compassionate uh, view of enslaved people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was so popular, and and why uh, uh, the slave narratives get uh, by people like Frederick Douglass and everything became much more prominent uh, in the 1850s was because of that. And Lincoln kind of played into that fed into it and in a way capitalized on it and he drew young america to his side which was pretty incredible yeah yeah i mean the, the switch over to, to you mean obviously in the 21st century the young uh, people can't imagine why these issues ever came up almost you know what, what what's this thing about race you know i mean it, it shows it's another stage of the same process that takes so long unfortunately but that process is still continuing, and the young people are responding exactly the same way. Um, and they find another another idea like socialism with Bernie or something like that, and get all right. excited, and then uh, get talked out of it a little later again. So uh, the the similarities are very interesting. But what's not similar is that is that Lincoln, who has this you know pristine reputation, was almost a brawler at the political events. I mean, he if if people misbehaved, he he, he didn't like to fight, but he he was a big guy, and he would stop fights, and he would get in fights, right? So tell a little bit about that, because it's, it's not it's not that commonly known. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. He grew up and grew up in a very rough culture on the frontier. He was born in a, a log cabin in Kentucky, of course. But uh, I recreate the entire quite violent culture, and uh, it was a culture of what was called rough and tumble fighting, which involved. The ultimate goal actually was to gouge out an eye, an eye eyeball, or mm-hmm. to. Uh, uh, I mean, really, not fight. just not just gouge it yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, to, to really take it out. To to take out the eyeball and or or to chop off an ear with yeah. with with your teeth. When you're now, feeling Link, when you're feeling charitable. <laughs> <laughs> just take an ear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll just have an an ear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But uh, Link, neither Lincoln nor his fa- his father was an excellent fighter. But uh, his father was shorter than Lincoln was six foot four. His father was shorter, but very tough. But one guy, the strongest guy around, um, wrestled his father, and his father just threw him easily. And from that point on, his father and nobody would touch his father. Mm-hmm. And people would try to do the same thing with Lincoln, but he just kind of tossed them off like a doll. And mm-hmm. finally, um, in Illinois, when he finally moved to Illinois, uh, this guy named Offutt was, which, who was almost like P.T. Barnum, he uh, kind of put on these shows. He said, "Oh, who can wrestle this tall, lanky guy over here, uh, Lincoln?" And a mm-hmm. very tough guy named Armstrong, very, very tough, muscular, went up against Lincoln, and Lincoln was thin wiry but quite thin and lincoln could have handled him fairly easily but uh, armstrong uh committed a foul a foul mm-hmm. and it became a draw but just the fact that lincoln had, had gone up against this guy and then also defeated many many other people in wrestling he never did the eye, eye gouging he refused he refused to do the eye, eye gouging thing refused mm. that kind of fight but and he defeated so many people that he really aroused the respect of a lot of these working class voters even quite early when mm-hmm. he was in his 20s uh of course once he 
got into a duel. Fortunately, um, <laughs> he criticized and he went through a little, you wouldn't call it quite a Trump phase, but he went through a phase where he was, he would use what was called slasher gaff rhetoric, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of slashing rhetoric about his opponents. This was when he was young and he, he offended this one person who challenged him to a duel. And so Lincoln as the, um, challenged person, uh, got to choose the weapons, you know, the, the weapon to be, and he, he chose the, he chose these very long swords because the other guy was quite short and Lincoln <laughs> knew that he, could, he said, he said, I can chop this guy in half. And he was also a very good ax person. Right. I can eat he didn't know that this guy Shields had been a fencing instructor, fen <laughs> a fencing <laughs> instructor. <laughs> and, uh, uh, who had ha, had been trained by Nap Napoleonic swordsmen. In mm -hmm. He was raised in England. He'd be trained. <laughs> trained uh, he, he was said to be able to defeat any anyone of any size. I mean, you know, fencing is, is is largely a matter of, it's not just you know, like, like that. Not, not just you the have to be able to yeah. <laughs> for, for, Fortunately, the duel was call, called off at the last moment. But mm -hmm. I don't think Lincoln going into the duel knew, <laughs> knew about that. He, he would not have survived. We would have had, if we had known he was going to be president, we'd have another Hamilton story, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating to see him as, as a, but, but as you said, his uh, fighting ability gave him cred ability with the, with the working class people yeah. in addition to his work and his hard work. Um, but also this fairness about it and is not getting so excited and not getting, you know, being a little bit rational about it. It's stepping back from it. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound like it to us, but in it, compared to the other people involved at the time, he seemed like a rational version of the whole problem, but he, he was not above uh, doing it. So it, the same thing about cruelty to animals, I thought was a very interesting part of what you said, because uh, you told some of the, I mean, before television, obviously, uh, you know, you don't mention cockfights, but there's cockfights and there's so many forms of entertainment that really were based upon animal cruelty. And you explained one of them, which was about the goose's head. I, I'd never heard of that one, but what a, what a strange yeah, form well, of it, entertainment. It, it was a terrible uh, a blood sport, uh, yeah. hanging, hanging the goose. And they, they would hang a, lot, uh, a live goose from a rope and people would gallop up. And the, the point was to try to tear off the head of the goose to tear it off mm. and the prize would be the goose that you could cook for your dinner. Okay. You mm. know, it was, it was a terrible, uh, Lincoln disapproved of that. He didn't, he was a good hunter, but he, he didn't like to hunt. In mm -hmm. fact, he, he, I mean, he was a good rifleman, but he didn't like, he, he hated, uh, he shot, he shot a Turkey, a wild Turkey when he was young and he felt so badly about it that he, he said, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like pulling a trigger ever again. Mm -hmm. As opposed to John Wilkes Booth, who who assassinated him, who would go around killing as a boy, killing stray cats, you know, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. just very, very cruel. And if anyone maltreated uh, like a turtle uh, or a rabbit, because sometimes uh, these frontiersmen, just for fun, they would throw a rabbit, a live rabbit, or a live turtle into the fire and watch them mm -hmm. burn. And 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 yeah. Lincoln would literally give speeches against animal cruelty, literally. And he would write essays about animal cruelty, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. As you say, I mean, he, he, he split the center by being of this kind and part of it, but he had his limits, you know, and, and he, he would explain his limits um, and he knew yeah. which limits to hide. <laughs> as he, said, <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, as the deist didn't, didn't uh, believe in religion uh, much, but in his, once he was in his early 20s, but he talked about it a little bit too much and was told, don't talk about this anymore, hide it. And, and, he, and he successfully did. Yes, yes. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, he, yeah. he knew how to be a good politician and very tact, tactful. But one of the things that was in your book about the background of his family and everything that I found interesting, in addition to the Puritan Cavalier thing, was uh, the whole idea that Kentucky land and the titles to Kentucky land were such a mess that family after family, you, know, you, you had one example where, where there were like 100 people who all thought they owned the, the same land. Uh, that, that kind of thing that, that people were always 
uh, uncertain about this because people now don't spend any time thinking, oh, we need to have a title system and we need to have you know, this in order to make sure everyone knows who owns what and surveyors. But he was a surveyor, right? That was one of the things that he learned to do. And, and uh, as a lawyer, he did a lot of that. But his family in Kentucky had to leave because they ended up owning the land that they thought they owned and that, that kind of thing. So, Yeah, it was called uh, land shingling. And it mm -hmm. happened uh, because can, the area of Kentucky used to be an extension of Virginia. And a lot of Eastern people had bought up vast territory of land. So they were the original owners. Then other owner, owners came and bought property within that land. And then, you know, Thomas Lincoln comes along. And meanwhile, three people before him are laying claim, claim to the land. So that's one reason why uh, they left Kentucky because there just was, you, it was like quicksand. You, you weren't sh sure if you actually owned the land that you lived on. Mm-hmm. Because so of the whole title. Yeah. And so the, moved, but whereas in Indiana, who is the, which was a younger state, uh, it was more parceled out by the government, by the state government, or plotted out by the government. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a much clearer, clearer kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. You also describe Indiana as, as uh, full of bears and wild animals and completely covered with trees. You know, we don't think of Indiana that way anymore, of course. Uh, but but uh, this was wild territory when he was there. Yeah, it was a young state uh, formed, um, you know, around 1816 or 1818. And uh, he, uh, you know, they go there in like 1819. Uh, um, and he grows up, he basically spends his sort of adolescence there. Uh, it's a very, very wild country. Um, very thick with brush and a lot of, uh, oh, birds, wild birds, and 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 bears, panthers, and so forth, and uh, and he remembered um, his Indiana sort of frontier home, and he sometimes had to walk um, several miles to go to school. Although he only back then, you only if you lived on the frontier, you only went to school for three months, mm -hmm. because for the rest of the months you had to help the family mm -hmm. um, earn you know earn the subsistence lifestyle just to get by. So uh, a lot of time he spent doing jobs around, around the cabin, around the farm and everything like that. But that's why he had less than one year of education because he went for three months here. Then a few years later, he went to three months there. These mm. were all little log cabin schools, one room school. Uh, and then as a teenager, he went for three months and it was very scattered kind of, kind of education. But it shows you that like now, back then, if you want to, you can educate yourself mm -hmm. because on the one hand, such little school, uh, schooling. And yet when he was a lawyer and going around on, on the law circuit, he would not only read Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe, but he mm -hmm. went through the entire seven books of Euclid geometry mm -hmm. and he taught himself geometry. And it shows that if you have enough initiative, you can really teach yourself and, and feed yourself. And again, he didn't do this out of, oh, I want to be a great geometrician or mm -hmm. a great Shakespearean actor. He did it because he was very curious. He, uh, very, mm -hmm. he was the only president uh, who has a patented invention. Uh, the invention didn't really pan out very well. It was for um, inflatable um bags to allow uh, steamboats, uh, riverboats to go over shallow places. Uh -huh. and it was a pretty good idea, but it never actually got manufactured. But still, he patented it, built a little model of it and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but it shows you, you his curiosity. Yeah. Curiosity. You tell a story about how he figured out how to move a, a, a steamboat that came up the Illinois, up, up a river in Illinois to an area and then got stuck on the way back and how he got it out, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. I also thought it was interesting how you, you'd, you'd make a boat, take it down, and then take the boat apart and sell it for lumber because <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> worth it to take it back. I thought yeah. that, was, that, that, showed, yeah. that showed the value of the boats that were being made. And, and, and you know, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of insights into, into exactly how people uh, live their lives um, by reading books about the 19th century and that time. Another, another character that, that one wouldn't think of is uh, Daniel Boone. Actually, the, the famous Daniel Boone was 
a neighbor. Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. Yeah, Davy Crockett. Okay, sorry. Davy Crockett was a neighbor of the of the of the well, Lincoln. Yeah, or the Boons. Watch. Uh, sorry. Well, Daniel Boone. There are two two people. Yeah. Daniel Boone. You're right. Was uh, quite close to the previous generation of Lincolns. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Boon, uh, the Boons, and the Lincolns had gotten to know each other in Pennsylvania. Then they traveled together down to Virginia, and then Daniel Boone um, came across with with Abraham, fa- uh, grandfather Abraham Lincoln, mm-hmm. uh, to Kentucky. Now, um, a Native American killed the grandfather Abraham Lincoln, but Daniel Boone settled then in Kentucky, but they were quite, quite close. Now, Davy Crockett uh, was another figure back then who was a politician, and uh, he became a figure of the Crockett Almanacs, and he was a, he was a frontiersman, mm-hmm. um, and in the Crockett Almanacs, he, was, he became a comic figure, but sort of grotesque comic, like his specialty was to gouge out eyeballs. And mm-hmm. people would, would laugh at this if you're reading this. Oh, ha, ha. And then he gives, he hangs the eyeballs and he gives them uh, as earrings to his girl, girlfriend. Right. And that's, what, that's supposed to be kind of funny. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. And, that it's uh, funny. Yeah. You know, he could, yeah, not, not that funny, but. Uh, and he was very violent, violent, but also kind of hilarious, sort of like a, a very madcap kind of humor, you know, very madcap yeah. with quite a lot of violence thrown in there. But that was the kind of, you know, world that uh, Lincoln grew, grew up in. <laughs> the mad magazine of its day, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that you, you mentioned are a couple of early speeches he gives, which I, I, I think is really great. Um, you say even in 1838, he talked about the mobocratic spirit being dangerous to our democracy. Okay? So that's a, another issue that's raised today. Um, he also gave very early speech uh, in favor of women's rights, although he was in favor of white women's rights as opposed to, to everyone's rights. But uh, even before the, the uh, Seneca Falls uh, thing, 10 years before that. So why don't you still say about, because he was pushing the envelope there. He, he was a centrist, but he pushed the envelope on a couple of issues. Um, so why don't you give uh, he, a little well, background about the famous speeches that he gave? We have a little bit of time for that. Well, his speeches moved from this anti-mob speech. What was happening back in the 1830s, which is when he gave that speech, was that a lot of mobs were assaulting African-Americans and also their defenders, abolitionists. Mm-hmm. And in one case, they, they actually hanged a lot of African, uh, these mobs, these white mobs were hanging uh, uh, African, it was like uh, Billy Holiday's strange fruit, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, lynchings. And he, he, he said, that, that this is horrible. This has to stop. So he really came up forcefully against that. At the same time that he, he, he thought that women should have rights. And this was, uh, you know, uh, 15 years before F- uh, Seneca Falls, the convention. Mm. Then uh, he has a speech uh, about temperance, about drinking, in which he says, you know, we shouldn't be damning these people who drink, these these people who find themselves addicted. We should sympathize with them. Because back then, there was this thing called dark reform that once you have your first drink, you're going to end up to be a a, a killer and a murderer, and you're going to wipe out your family. He said, People who drink are just like you. He didn't drink himself, but they're they're us. They're us, Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, which is why he supported the Washingtonians who were were ex-alcoholics who got together and would discuss things and so forth. So he said, no, 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 we we, we have to be that way. And it kind of marked a transition toward a much more persuasive and a gentler approach uh, out of that previous slasher gaff rhetoric. Mm-hmm. So by the time he gives the Getter, the Gettysburg Address, which is many years later, during the Civil War, it's a much more unifying rhetoric. It's not damning anybody. It's including all of uh, America under the umbrella of equality. And then when he gives the second inaugural address, he says, malice toward none, charity to all. Malice toward none, charity to all. And um, 
it shows the expansion of his vision and of his compassion. His compassion was there from the beginning, but he mm -hmm. finally reaches a level in the Gettysburg Address and in the uh, second inaugural where he really tries to encompass all of America. Well, uh, we have maybe about 10 minutes left. So uh, one thing I don't want to miss is the convention in 1860, the Republican convention. He is somebody who was a congressman. Um, he was a state legislator, uh, but he's not that nationally known except for, for these speeches. He almost became a senator, but, um, but it didn't work in the Electoral College version in Illinois. I mean, it was senators were still chosen by the leg state legislatures. And so, although he won the vote, he still didn't win the, the, the Senate in 1858. So he was famous, but he didn't ha hadn't really had any really big offices. And here he comes in to the 1860 Republican Convention. And it's in, held in Chicago. Now, first question that I have is, do you think that he would have been the candidate if it hadn't been held in Chicago? If it had been no, held because, in New York or someplace else? Yeah, no, no, because, no, because, um, what happened was that, in a way, he was a dark horse candidate. He wasn't as well known as William mm -hmm. Henry Seward or even Bates. There were several people who were, who were better known, but a little more controversial, particular, uh, particularly Seward was, was mm -hmm. a very anti-slavery controversial, considered almost too radical and everything. And Lincoln was kind of seen as a moderate. He had posed as kind of a moderate centrist, even though everybody knew he was anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. but still much more in the center. Uh, but still, uh, the his friends uh, who were very high in the Republican Party schemed for Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, which was his, he lived in Illinois. And uh, one of his close friends actually gave free tickets to the convention to kind of pack the convention. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that when Lincoln's name came up, uh, there was huge screams of approval, and he mm -hmm. lost on the first ballot. He came up a little bit on the second ballot, but there was this kind of growing volume of Lincoln screamers. There's a screaming yeah. there, and this enthusiasm caught hold. And on the third ballot, he squeaked. He squeaked by, and he won mm -hmm. the nomination. But yeah, if it hadn't been held there, I really don't. I don't know if he would have been nominated you know. right yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah he'd even been nominated so yeah. and and interestingly he didn't go to the convention and the people who were running did not go to the convention it was all managed by other people was that part of plausible deniability or <laughs> <laughs> of, how, of how you of how you won because he didn't you know you wouldn't yeah, think he, was, he would have managed his campaign the way it ended up being managed but it certainly got managed in a way that got him in as the nominee yeah at the time, uh, you neither campaigned for yourself. Uh, when Stephen Douglas campaigned for himself in the 1860 election, everyone made fun of him. Oh, that's little Stephen looking for his mama. Because supposedly he was traveling to Vermont to visit his mother. But right. he was making a cross-country tour, giving speeches. Oh, little Stevie is, is the baby looking for his mama. <laughs> but you, you, you weren't supposed to campaign. You, you had these yeah. rallies that other people held. And the same thing with the convention. I mean, when the convention was going on, Lincoln was down in Springfield, Illinois, playing mm -hmm. handball, you know, and, <laughs> you know uh, with, with some boys. <laughs> <laughs> and then he hears, oh, I'm, I'm elected. Oh, I'll go tell my, my little woman. The, he, he was married to Mary Todd Lincoln, yeah. uh, who's rather short. Uh, I think she'd be more interested in this than I am. <laughs> 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 well, you do you do tell about Mary Todd Lincoln choosing him, saying he wasn't pretty, but I know he'll be president one day. Is yeah. that an apocryphal story, or I mean, that, <laughs> what what kind of how much evidence is there that that she actually said that in the 1840s before he became president? I, I was curious about that one. Well, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, I do know that um, she grew up in a kind of what we might call a ritzy household in Kentucky where mm -hmm. she was always around these important people like Henry Clay, who was always running for the presidency. He was a famous Senator and he was a very close friend, friend of the family. And he, uh, she would tell Henry Clay and other people, I'm going to grow up and marry a president. Mm -hmm. I'm going to grow up and marry a president. So even from, so I do believe that she said that at one point that mm -hmm. he's not particularly pretty, but I think he's going to be president. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you tell another great story about Mary Todd's family. Uh, one of her relatives, um, her, her son had a lover who was uh, a slave and had a daughter with that person. And then she wanted to free him. The son died at a certain point. And the relative, who was the grandmother of the, of the, the daughter, uh, she, she wanted to free them. And the husband only would do it if she turned over her estate to him, which was worth a half a million dollars. It was, it was an interesting story. I think you said that they went to Liberia to, you know, to, to live a freer life. I'm not sure. That's another part of that whole story that we don't, we, we, I want you to mention. Um, but people were talking about moving the Blacks to Africa as opposed to just you know, freeing them and having them integrate with everybody. So uh, as you said in the book, a lot of the people who were even rabid you know, anti-slavery people were racist. Yeah, yeah. And Lincoln himself uh, publicly supported colonization. That's what it was called, the mm -hmm. removal of emancipated people to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but that was really part, but he, at the same time, he knew that was kind of impossible because yeah. you had 4 million enslaved people. And if they were emancipated to back then to ship 4 million people, but you know, he, he really yeah. he even said, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of impossible, but he sort of supported it because actually it was a very, very popular movement mm -hmm. um, from Thomas Jefferson through Andrew Jackson, through Henry Clay, through even Harriet Beecher Stowe, mm -hmm. in even Henry David Thoreau. Uh, there, there, there were so many people who kind of supported it, although nothing much ever came of it. I mean, I mm -hmm. think about 14,000 total uh, Afri uh, 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 formerly enslaved people were actually right. uh, uh, removed back uh, um, between 1816 and 1865. So nothing really much came of it. And finally, he abandons uh, the idea of colonization and he says, no, I, I want emancipation and hopefully integration into mainstream society. And then he becomes the first president to publicly endorse the vote, the vote for African-Americans. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's so much more and your book is, is so full thing. There, but there is one question that's come in. So we'll we'll, we'll end with that question. Um, it's about John Wilkes Booth and the assassination. Obviously, John Wilkes Booth was a Southerner who, who was really furious at the destruction or he saw the imminent destruction of his culture. Um, given what happened with Andrew Johnson becoming the president. Now, part of his plot was to kill Andrew Johnson, too. Right. It, it didn't work. So, yeah. So 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 part of this question that's being asked is, is maybe not. Uh, aware of that possibility. But he's saying by, by making Andrew Johnson president, wasn't that one of the best wartime acts the Southerner could do um, to, to try to move the, the, the effect of the Civil War to, to, to nullify the effect of the Civil War, essentially? So what did you, yeah, what you think good, about that? Yeah, It's a good question. Um, Lincoln didn't choose Andrew Johnson because back then, uh, the, Republic, the um, vice presidential um, person uh, candidate was chosen by convention. And mm -hmm. the reason uh, the Republicans um, chose Andrew Johnson is that Johnson had been governor of Tennessee uh, and had remained loyal to the Union, mm -hmm. to the North. And um, we don't know really how much uh, Lincoln really admired Johnson, but I think he sort of tolerated him. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that um, what would happen. But yeah, I mean, Booth, Booth unwittingly Booth ho hoped to create chaos, but unwittingly he actually helped the pro-slavery faction because Andrew Jackson, uh, Andrew Johnson, was a, a white supremacist who mm -hmm. squelched um, radical Reconstruction mm -hmm. and set the whole process toward Jim Crow America, uh, toward uh, the Ku Klux Klan lynching and all of that mm. uh some of that took place under and uh, andrew johnson and then quite a bit of it researched later on during during jim crow but yeah uh, in a way um without knowing it john wilkes booth who himself was a rabid white supremacist and he mm. uh he heard um abraham lincoln give his speech in which he said i i think african-americans should have the vote mm -hmm. should be citizens and 
And at that point, and, and Booth was in the audience. He says, now I'm really going to put him through. Now, and, and three days later, he, he killed, he killed uh, Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, as you say, one of his Confederates was supposed to kill Johnson, but he got drunk in a bar and he, <laughs> he chickened out. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, didn't quite have the nerve to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, as, as we wish a lot more plots like that would end that way, although actually they do, uh, right. according to the, to the police reports. So a lot of, a lot of plots end up uh, in a drunken mess. And don't yeah. go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. They say, you know, uh, one of the one of the great things about anarchy is that it's hard to get it organized, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, there's so much more in the book. We only covered different pieces of it. Um, it, it and, and lots of great pictures from the time too. So thank you very much for for coming to our audience uh, in this virtual way, and uh, we thank all of you for watching. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you, George. Thank you. My pleasure.